now, uh, without uh, wasting any more time, let me get to introducing uh, the speaker for today. Uh, I, on behalf of DRLCWS, uh, you know, would like to say that we are extremely honored to have the speaker for today's session, Brent Stefan Delar, who will be presenting a webinar titled Wrong Script, the Lecture Script and Typography, a Liberal Inquiry. Uh, Brent Stefan Delar is a scholar of linguistics. Hailing from Switzerland, he is a teacher of languages, informatics, and music. He is also an information and technology developer, where his focus uh, predominantly lies on uh, web design and Asian fonts. Brent Stefan has a keen interest in the studies of Tibetan language and script, and has specialized in this field as a student of Ben Lama Tenzin Kunsok and Dr. Peter Lindegger. Uh, this is at Tibet Institute Recon in Switzerland. His engagement in Buddhist studies is extensive, and he has also carried out an independent research on the history and culture of the Buddhist kingdom of Sikkim. Ren Stefan Della has been a research associate of the Sikkim Bhutia Lepcha Apex Committee, more popularly known as SIBLAC, since uh, 2012, and is also the webmaster of SIBLAC. Aside from being the webmaster of the affected citizens of Tista, Drokpa, and Sheikhed Dratsang at Sanagara. <clears throat> Ren Stefan Della also has a plethora of research publications that focus on the themes of history of Sikkim and uh, lecture studies. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Ren Stefan, for agreeing to uh, be the speaker for today's webinar. Uh, I think uh, we should not waste any more time and go forward with uh, your presentation. Thank you very much. The pleasure is absolutely mine. All right. Great. Romit Rongup song Samsa Nimo. And for all non lecture speakers, I'm one of them as well. Welcome to that presentation on the lecture script. It's a feature unique to mankind that we attempt to make up for real or perceived deficiencies with real or invented substitutes. If we face something of which we do not know or understand the content or the context, we create one with the help of another talent unique to the human species, imagination. Compensation is a term firmly established in science since Alfred Adler's development of individual psychology in the early 20th century and regarded, meanwhile, as an inborn capability of man to get along with lacks of whatever kind. We simply compensate for shortages with fictional creations of our own in a degree inversely proportioned to our self-esteem, by the way. So this unusual mix of a lady's hair and a swarm of birds may be confusing at first sight. It will, however, take just a short moment for everyone among us to create his or her understanding or interpretation of that skillful drawing, producing 20 or 30 different stories instantly. And while all of our stories may hold some truth, we will, of course, not mistake our version with the truth as such. This deep-rooted pattern does, however, not only apply to the individual human being, likewise gaps in the collective memory relating to ancient times and generations are filled with imaginary narratives, which, if not true, are congenial inventions that satisfy our quest for integrity. This is a response so common that Italians coined the most current saying, se non è vero è ben trovato. If it's not true, it's at least well conceived. 
In regard to the history of the Eastern Himalayas, we dwell in a profound area of conflict between two contrasting notions of the term history, creating both lack and abundance at the same time. On the one hand, we have the academic historiography, preferably relying on chronicles providing accurate details of date, time and conditions of a given historical event, though sometimes running into nothingness when going back in time more than a few centuries. On the other hand, the traditional understanding of history in the Himalayan cultures may be characterized with the Tibetan label Namtar, a literary class of glorifying tales, arranging fact and legend as required, while blanking out aspects considered undesirable or irrelevant to yield a good story. They may often appear rather incomplete, vague, or even contradictory in terms of accuracy, but they are most comprehensive in regard to a holistic worldview, maintaining the splendid tradition of storytelling. While the academic approach a good many times has to settle for a we do not know or we do not yet know, the Namtar always knows or at least pretends to. All the same, the two notions should not be played off against each other. Both have their merits as well as their faults. The exactitude of the one will maybe not offer meaningful insight, while the bloomy narrative of the other will possibly not provide us with trustworthy hard facts. Thus it is uh, with utmost respect and modesty we are trying to validate in the following a few of the narratives related to the Rome script that have been in circulation for a century or more. Since this is an exercise in the conflict zone mentioned before, our findings can't be expected to be in terms of true or false, but at best in terms of making sense or not. I'd like to inspect uh, four common narratives I've chosen for consideration uh, two points regarding the creation of the script, one attributing it to Tikong Mensalo and the other uh, to Chögyantrak Dornamgyal. Then to the uh, narrative that the script was developed to spread Buddhism among the lectures, and finally, a tale that ancient lecture manuscripts were destroyed by Buddhist extremists. To start with the endmost tale, it's a matter of fact that we do not know of a single lecture manuscript that could reliably be dated to the pre-1800s. A common narrative explains this oddity with a campaign of biblioclasm, meaning destruction of books, by the Buddhist monks in order to eliminate the competing literary heritage of their own folk. This accusation was first raised in writing by Mannering in 1876, and we do not know whether this is what he perceived personally or whether he recorded an existing oral tradition. Esteemed lecture elder Arthur Foning, assessing that matter a hundred years later, however, cautions us, I quote, Colonel Mannering had given out that all the lecture books were collected and burned. This false and distorted notion was later repeated and taken up by the others too. But a little reflection on the matter makes it amply clear that it could not have been a fact." Unquote. 
Unfortunately, Fonin does not share his reflections. So we have to delve into the matter on our own with a look at the somewhat simplified timeline of Maya Liang. What we know of the early history of Sikkim is based on oral transmission and Namdar type records with a blood brotherhood between Lepcha and Budya as a starting point. The historicity of which is generally accepted. In the late 13th or in the 14th century, Tikung Tek and Gibbon Sat mutually agreed upon a peaceful coexistence of their respective clans in what was later to become Zhenzhong. It must be assumed that with the entry of the Tibetans, their religion began to spread in the new habitat likewise. Buddhism grew in terms of influence to an extent permitting three learned lamas, globally addressed as Najo Jeshi, to establish a Buddhist ki kingdom in the mid 17th century, imposing a Buddhist upper class on the tribals living with the same space incorporating Lepcha and Lingu leaders in the position as ministers, generals, or Zongpen. Considering the surviving manuscripts, it must be assumed that the alleged biblioclasm would have taken place around 1800. Taking into account further that this had been after a period of 400 years of Buddhist influence, including a final period of 150 years with powerful Buddhist dominance, we hardly find plausibility in the charge hawked. If ever, we would assume extremist Buddhists to target competing spiritual wisdom in particular. However, the native beliefs of the Rongku represent a marked oral tradition with rituals, prayers, and incantations passed down from master to student exclusively, so much so that we actually face the downside of that very tradition. Ancient religious heritage is feared lost as two of the most uh, eminent Bongting, Samdup Taso and Pentsiring Lecha, passed away in 2011 or uh, 2014, respectively, without having imparted their wisdom to a successor in time. So, what to torch? And if ever, why so late? Mayil Yang had been transformed to a Buddhist kingdom long ago. Besides, Northern Buddhism in the tradition of Guru Rinpoche never resorted to the exclusion of forerunning spiritual traditions, quite the opposite. Over time, Mahayana absorbed countless pre-existing local traditions and incorporated hundreds of native deities into the pantheon of a basical, basically non-theistic philosophy. After all, the tutelary deities of Sikkim are, without exception, of pre-Buddhist origin. So we find that the tale of intentional destruction of the ancient lecture manuscripts a violation of human rights according to present standards does not ring true or at least deserves a big question mark. Since when in 1663, a few years after his coronation, Chögyel Puntsok Namgyel felt the need to secure his power with the well-known Lomen Tsong Sum agreement, the text of which has been preserved, 
<coughs> excuse me. The deities of the Lepcha and the Limbu were invoked side by side with the Buddhist protectors to witness and defend the agreement and all those abiding by its rules. After all, this does not sound like a fierce clash of cultures. Not to be mistaken, we are quite certain that there were all the documents in Rome's script and they were destroyed, most obviously. However, their destruction was hardly caused by fire, rather the opposite. The water is likely to be blamed. To illustrate that hypothesis, we may for a while just close our eyes and depend on our imagination and sense of smell. Stepping into a bookshop in Darjuliang, in Damsang, in Kursang, or in Sufuk. So we step in, eyes shut, nostrils wide open, and we take a deep breath. What we smell is so common we hardly ever notice consciously. It's the smell of decay, the fog of mildewing paper. In plain language, the climate of the subcontinent is paper unfriendly, to say the least. Ancient Indians wrote on palm leaves with good reason. Chinese type or industrial paper decomposes if not properly cared for. The preservation of paper under local conditions is a true challenge. And as much as lecture elders may lament Western collectors, having carried away hundreds of ancient lecture manuscripts, it must be said, their transfer was probably the key to the very survival of these cultural treasures. Coming to the hearsay, attributing the creation of the script to the desire of promoting the Buddha's teachings among the wrong, we have to bear in mind another characteristic of Northern Buddhism. The spread of the gentle doctrine took place to highest degree based on religious works written or printed in Sambhota script, popularly named Tibetan script, spanning distances of thousands of miles from Buryatia to Bhutan, from Kalmykia to Kham. Every educated devotee from the humble novice monk right up to the emperor of China, learn, learned to read and write, Uchen at least. Displayed, we see a Tibetan text from mid 18th century, written by Emperor Qianlong's own hand. Learning considered a privilege, the emperor of China learned a lot, among others, he studied Buddhist philosophy, which required the study of Tibetan script beforehand. The idea of translating the sacred ancient wisdom using a completely new script for a comparably minor group of tribals just does not fit in this general scenario. Of course, the venture would have been appropriate for a Dharma Raja, but in the case of the third king of Sikkim, we may be led astray by wishful thinking. Chagya Chaktor Namgyal enjoyed a rather short reign of 17 years, ascending the throne at the tender age of 14. He spent the first seven years of his rule in exile in Tibet, reportedly excelling in his Buddhist studies and studies of astrology, being appointed personal astrologer to the sixth Dalai Lama. Back in Sikkim, priorities in Chattu Namgyal's remaining lifespan 
where the enforcement of his rule, fiercely challenged by his elder sister, Bandi Wangmo. The ambitious princess seen here in a mural at the Sigmund Monastery, as well as pushing back the Bhutanese troops that had invaded Sikkim in support of his rival sister. Besides, the Chagyal is remembered as the regenerator of the Pangnatsul rituals and as the creator of the Pangtu Cham uh, warrior dance. All his activities, including the restructuring and consolidation of his principality in close consultation with his spiritual guide, Lama Jingme Pao, must have kept him occupied to capacity. Hence, it's hard to believe he would have had the spare time to learn and analyze Rong Aring to adapt permitting him to develop a dedicated script based on the particular grammar and requirements of the language. Not to mention a convincing reason to do so, which is really difficult to make out. <clears throat> His creatorship is unlikely all the more as the basic word, the very foundation of the lecture script called Lozong, is virtually unique and without reference to anything the Chögyā may have seen and learned in the whole of his Tibetan Buddhist upbringing and education. Lozong is a uh, syllabary meticulously listing all the close to 8,000 syllables that can be clustered with the basic glyphs of the script. At the same time, it represents an extensive encyclopedia of the wrong language. And reading the song, or rather reciting in a given rhythm and melody, is a common rite among the wrong folk. To take the uh, center passage of the second line here. No, it's the third. Lam 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 lim lim lom 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 lam. That to follow seven hundred times, which I will spare you. So these are standalone features without matching any of the neighboring cultures, which is why the origin of the script may be assumed to lie within the wrong community itself. These considerations lend credibility to the native legends of the letter naming Tikung Mensalong as the creator of the wrong script. Variably portrayed as a shaman or bonting, a hunter or a scholar, he is a legendary personality who lived to the age of 300 years, according to some sources. As a historical figure, we have reason to believe he was a contemporary of Latsun Namka Jinme, acting as his advisor and guide after the opening of the hidden land in the first half of the 17th century. The royal history of Sikkim gives a detailed account of how Mensalong introduced Latin Jembo to the sacred caves, hot springs and rocks of Mail Yang. Marked red in the short excerpt here, it's an excerpt from the history of Sikkim, we say the name of Mensalong and marked blue, the places mentioned by name, among them Larininpuk and Tejimpu. He was the one who intimately knew the ancient places of power that were to provide the basic topographical and spiritual frame of the overlaying Buddhist mandala, expanding from the hub of Trashiting in West Seeking. 
where the most sacred Bunju ritual was celebrated yesterday and the day before yesterday. And taking the liberty of a pinch of heresy for once, we can't rule out that the wisdom of Men Salong was the actual source of the Zhenzhong Neyik, the guides to the sacred hidden land composed or revealed as a dharma by Buddhist masters. Just as well as we may consider that Rivo Sangchu, the distinguished mountain smoke offering, is a Buddhist adaptation of a traditional Rong ritual. The bottom line then were that the ancient Rong spiritual heritage was neither, has neither been destroyed nor suppressed, but redefined to form the very core of a local Sikkimese Buddhist tradition. Men Salong's relevance, as well as his connection with Latsun Chembo, the patron saint of Sikkim, is confirmed by the presence of an ancient statue of the lecture scholar at the Sungma Kang of Dupdi Monastery, the only halfway authentic portrait of the Tikung. It sounds plausible that when working with Sikkim's patron saint, he realized the value and importance of written records and transmissions whereupon he developed the writing system for Rongaring, an undertaking he was perfectly suited for due to his profound familiarity with the language and culture of his native tribe. All the same obvious structural inconsistency, inconsistencies in Rongyuk as known today provide evidence that the script underwent a natural development, including later amendments and omissions that weren't the work of the original creator. As such, it's also thinkable that Mensalong refined an already existing writing system. To sum up our brief considerations, we found one of the initial legends to deserve trust while rejecting the other three owing to various reasons. Let's not forget, however, that science is just the current state of misapprehension, according to a popular dictum. A supplementary note may be due regarding the reposit repositories of lecture manuscripts in Western institutions, briefly alluded to before. Berlin, Vienna and London libraries are known to hold a number of original documents scattered in different collections. For Vienna, they were collected by Nebeski Wojkowicz in the mid 20th century, while those in London were mainly brought in by Hodgson and Hooker in the run of the 19th century. Just look at that uh, close up. What an elegant handwriting. Isn't it breathtaking? It's a text written by probably uh, Dom Sangmu. And it must be a religious text because in the uh, fourth line right here, you can see the Genresi mantra spelled um, ma, ni, be, mi, hung. This scan uh, is, at the, is from the British Library. The British Library sponsored the program as part of the Endangered Archives project carried out by Renew Helene Plaisir, mentioned earlier around 2010. She was granted access to the holdings of five open minded collectors in Rongliang itself. The scans of these approximately 40 manuscripts are showcased at the website of the British Library. And a few documents in wrong script can also be found among the scanned papers 
of the Sikkim Palace archives, digitized by the Project Denjong under the direction of Semla Bema Abrams and accessibly at the British Library website as well. The most eminent treasury within Europe is, however, the Johann von Mahnen collection of lecture manuscripts at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands. Von Mahnen, himself a Dutch man, held the assignment as General Secretary of the Asiatic Society of Bengal from 1923 to 1939. He was an ardent collector of ancient manuscripts, not only to possess them, but more importantly, to understand their message. No wonder he spent more than two years near Darjeeling studying Tibetan language with tutors associated with uh, Yiga Chuling Monastery at Groom. And throughout his academic research, he enjoyed closest cooperation with local experts like Karma Samde Paul, also known as Karma Babu, and Punsok Lungtok, present in this photograph taken at von Mahnes Calcutta office around 1924. The Leiden Library offers a corpus of around 180 lecture manuscripts in high resolution scans that can be viewed and downloaded freely by anyone. The collection is online since 2014 and was made available at the Institute's own initiative. So, if more local owners of manuscripts would share their treasures as generously, we'd likely know much more about the heritage and language of the wrong community. Unfortunately, unfortunately, it must be said that many Ronko jealously hide their gems from the study by interested researchers, as well as from the attention of a wider public. Without intention to diminish the merits of countless Ronko and Rongmit, it may come as a surprise that much of the groundbreaking linguistic research and grammatical analysis of the lecture language is owed to Westerners. First and foremost, Christian missionaries. Names such as Start, Niebel, Stölke, McKeen, Mennering, Waddell, Grünwedel, Nebeski Wojkowicz, Sprick, Plesir, without claim to be exhaustive, line up to a remarkable sequence of dedicated researchers. The same can be said in regard to lecture typography. Christian missionaries pushing to the Northeast were in need of printed religious tracts in local languages for the spread of the gospel. For the reverends and fathers unfolding their seal in the area of Darjeeling and Kalimpong, Sikkim proper was forbidden territory until around 1890. Local language meant wrong aring in the first instance, which says a lot about the status of the language at that period. It's safe to assume that the evangelists chose the language that promised widest access to the local flock, just as much as their initial assistance emerging from among the first converts were predominantly wrong folk. Seen in the photograph here, the uh, Western gentleman standing at the right is uh, Dr. Graham in his younger years. Lecture was used as the primary language of evangelization until dropped in favor of Nepali by the Protestant missionaries around 1930. A disloyalty too hard to digest for a considerable number of lecture converts 
especially in Kalimpong. The Reverend Francis Sittling and many of his clanmates thus changed allegiance and became Roman Catholics. The Catholic Church was somewhat surprised at the unexpected joinings. However, they were all to welcome in St. Peter's hitherto rather mega local flock, while quid pro quo, their language was held in due esteem at the new confraternity. For their typographical requirements, the missionaries found re reliable partners at the Baptist Mission Press at Calcutta, a set of mov movable types for lecture was cast under the supervision of Reverend James Thomas in the 1840s. We presume he did so on the directions provided by his clients working on site. We can say with absolute certainty, however, that he created the tool of a century. The types of the Reverend Thomas where to shape the general perception of the script for at least 150 years. Used for translations of the Christian gospel, produced in-house, or mannering grammar of the wrong language, McKean's lecture primer, for example, the Baptist font holdings at Calcutta were literally unique. Whoever wanted to have lecture script printed elsewhere had to resort to expressive photolithographic procedures. As far as we know, the wrong types were in use to the 1970s when the Baptist Mission Press closed down and sold the equipment at scrap metal price prices for recycling. From the unknown beginnings to the year 2000, lecture text meant basically handwritten lecture text, with the few exceptions mentioned before, and to a high degree this holds true to the present day. All the same, at the turn of the millennium, the groundbreaking potential of the lately developed digital options in text processing were perceived by a few progressive minds and literally, bit by bit, explored with the release of the first true type fonts. The first one was Shipmu, designed and developed by Ren Ogien Shipmu from Sikkim. And this was released in April 2001. And shortly after, Deji Lepcha was published. Uh, a font designed by Jason Glavy, a US American, and released in November 2001. We see two samples right here. Due, their, to, uh, due to their custom encoding, the two fonts form a closed system. Since they merely represent, represent lecture shapes, pasted on a Latin encoded font system, a text written in one of them can only be displayed in the same font again. Opening a document on a system which does not provide the respective font results in meaningless rows of Latin characters. According to Latin writing direction, input has to be strictly done in the order of glyphs from left to right, which more, than, more often than not differs drastically from the spelling. The term rongup, for example, has to be typed in a sequence showed in red below the two samples. Uh, with these forms, uh, accurate placement of the components is a virtual challenge. And uh, we see that the syllabic cluster often appear to be aesthetically unsatisfactory. Apart from these shortcomings, and more importantly, 
They faced technological obsolescence shortly after their launch as the Unicode Consortium endeavored to incorporate Lecture into its global encoding system. Unicode is an IT standard for the consistent encoding, representation and handling of text expressed in most of the world's writing systems. The first standard was, uh, standard was published in 1991. Meanwhile, we've reached version 14, encompassing around 100 different scripts. Unicode is cross-platform and makes it possible to distinctly recognize and handle characters by unit code, uh, unique codes. The fonts are interchangeable and a lecture text written in any one of them can be restyled with another one on the fly. Moreover, input of characters in Unicode is done according to spelling. A detailed and well-researched proposal for the inclusion of ROM in Unicode was submitted in 2002. Hence, the first implementation of the lecture script in Unicode, which we see here, a sample of the Lecture Language Kit for OS X, released by Xenotype Technologies in 2003, represented true spirit of avant-garde, but required the other side of the coin, slide adjustments after the final adoption of the standard in 2008. The font used Jason Glavis glyphs, representing themselves a copy of Re uh, Reverend Thomas's characters to a large extent. However, in a completely different encoding system, holding to the standards of Unicode. The software by Xenotype is no longer available, unfortunately. Upon the demise of developer Daniel Kay in 2003, Xenotype closed down business activities. Kay's typographic legacy is feared lost. One of the most demanding aspects of the ROM script for font developers is the clustering of glyphs known as collation in typographic nomenclature. While, as mentioned, Latin runs strictly from left to right, the same is true for Tibetan, with the additional difficulty of having to deal with vertical stacks of up to four glyphs. Lecture collation, however, is erratic, resulting at times in virtual hops across any direction and in any sequence thinkable. Up to two glyphs may be attached to the left, to the bottom and to the top, while up to three glyphs may follow to the right of the initial. This represents the most unusual feature of the script, occasionally bringing forth vowels entirely written from left, right to left, or more commonly, clusters formed in a zigzag pattern, which often requires a reordering of the glyphs typed just before. Considering the complex arrangement of the glyphs, it's fully comprehensible that not a single attempt was ever made to develop a lecture typewriter. In consequence, this also led to the lack of an established keyboard layout for wrong arring on computers, since these were usually adopted from those of the respective typewriters. Based on the advanced potential of the open type font format jointly developed by Microsoft and Adobe, two eminent companies set about creating Unicode fonts for Rongring. They have had casual updates, casual updates, and they work quite reliably meanwhile. 
we see here listed as, no, uh, as number four, uh, Minzat, of which SIL International initiated the development in 2011. The glyphs are JSON glyphs again, and Minzat is distributed free of charge under an open font license available at the SIL computer and writing systems page. Listed here as number five is Noto Sans Lepcha, a font developed by the Google Noto team since 2003. And this font now represent, represented a virtual breakthrough. As mentioned earlier, the design of the glyphs by the Reverend Thomas had an enormously formative and lasting effect on the perception of the lecture script for many generations. This is not only owned, owed to the fact that his types were, were the only ones available for a very long time. It is as much due to Jason Glavy's replication of the Baptist design, saving it, saving it into the digital era and as you can see, of the five fonts released between 2001 and 2013, three use his version of Thomas's char characters, marked red in our font comparison list here, which further cemented his notion of the script, including presumable faults. Comparing the Baptist characters to all their handwritten papers, we realize a fact forgotten despite being most evident. The undertaking of the Baptist mission press represented the evolutionary transition from handwriting to print and called for a narrowed down choice out of a multitude of shapes and styles. For the Reverend Thomas, simplicity and uniformity was an absolute imperative. The manuscripts, however, display an unmatched richness illustrated here with the simple syllable cut extracted from a random choice of manuscripts available as scans. To get back briefly to the topic of origin treated earlier. The samples of variant shapes could be doubled in number easily. The emergence of such diversity requires time. All the more as writing wasn't everybody's pastime in the 17th and 18th century. Remember that to be a scribe was a respected profession and skilled personal was much sought after. Considering further that Asian cultures generally do not excel in terms of creativity, but rather in reproduction true to tra tradition, the emergency of this range of variants took, in my humble opinion, longer than a mere hundred years which is why we have to consider the script was developed prior to the reign of Chodyal Chaktor Namgyan. So why shouldn't one revive that calligraphic opulence of aged manuscripts using the potential of modern technology? Accordingly, Toshi Omagari took a liberal approach designing a truly fresh set of lecture characters, and he ventured to correct at least one of the annoying faults in the traditional look. While in Thomas's font, the vowel signs for A and O look exactly the same, and are the reason for confusion, especially among learners and unexperienced readers, Omagari reintroduced a different design of Jomingakub A with a small hook or flag. The first two verses of Psalm 67, a sample extracted from a Baptist print, 
clearly demonstrate the Calcutta type makers weren't fully certain about the vowel sign O. Is it a curve written in one stroke or does it consist of two separate glyphs? Or maybe is it even a combination of the vowel sign O combined with Ranquet, as handwritten text preserved would suggest? Glavy decidedly defines the glyph as a one-stroke bend, which, by the way, were impossible to write with a broad net bamboo or reed pen. The same oval sign in the notofont yet consists of a slightly curved stroke down and the horizontal top stroke to the right. So the modern look of the glyphs designed by Doshi Omagari partly reverts to the shaping of characters found in handwritten older documents. And it is much to the credit of the Japanese developer to have left the beaten path of just reproducing more or less the characters created by the Reverend James Thomas. Unintentionally, but in full conformity with Murphy's law, Noto-san's lecture unveils its persisting flaw in the first line here. Uh, combinations and uh, of final consonants and rantiet are still invariably misplaced in this uh, noto lecture font. Since in 2015, the two Unicode, phone, uh, Unicode fonts available showed yet grave flaws. CBLAC launched an initiative to overcome the digital gap in regard to wrong typography. After a development period of close to one year, we released Ronkit, a package containing fully functional Unicode fonts and keyboard files for Windows, Mac OS, and Linux, meaning Debian forks of Linux. While the font mannering wrong represents a classical look, which shapes as if written with a broad nipped bamboo pen. Dava Lepcha, the second sam sample here, um, has a more modern look with linear and rounded profile, which blends quite well with Latin sans serif fonts. And the third in the set, Rongyuk Mono, represents an altogether different approach with a highly abstract look and monospaced characters, meaning they all have the same width, which may not be suitable for entire pages of text, but an option for titles, headlines, accentuations, or the like. So, for a number of years, we have had a few different Unicode fonts available. However, their impact on native writers is close to nil, bearing a few using the Noto font as part of some Android distributions. The great majority, however, cleaves to either handwriting or the first two workaround fonts in Sikkim, this is mainly Shipmu, while in Kalimpong, JG Lepcha appears to be the preferred one. It looks like the wrong community having suffered a grave loss of lore and equally absorbed with the revival or reconstruction of tradition has little liking for the achievements of modern technology, at least in this regard. Maybe will just require another 150 years. Though perhaps not apparent at first sight, the advantages of Unicode are revolutionary, singular, and far-reaching. A lecture text written in Unicode can be copied 
pasted, revised, restyled, displayed, shared, searched, and used in websites as native text instead of in unreadable images. And this is available in any IT environment. The technology thus provides full exchangeability without regard to application or operating system. And by the way, Google, Facebook, Instagram, and the like, they understand lecture as well, provided it's written in Unicode. I'd like to end this brief presentation with what Buddhist masters usually put to the very beginning of their reflections. Please don't just believe me. Listen to what I tell you, then scrutinize my words. If they appear to be trustworthy, keep them close to your heart. If they do not pass your verification, forget about them. I consider your long and undivided attention an undeserved honor. Ladies and gentlemen, best thanks. And as a last, I'd like to show you uh, the link to a small handout, which is really only a link list. You can find it and uh, save it for yourself at ziplac.org slash webinar.pdf where I collected all the links to the repositories of manuscripts at the European universities as well as the pages where to download Unicode fonts. So you just type that into the uh, address line of your browser and you'll get that uh, document opened. And now really my final slide, my congrats to the uh, team at uh, the Rong Ring Society. I was very amused with the wordplay they inserted into the flyer for that webinar, webinar wrong script but right stuff thank you very much back to ren jordan thank you very much uh, ren stefan for your wonderful presentation the walkthrough was an incredible incredible learning experience uh, in so many different dimensions mm -hmm.